You know, economy affects most businesses and it's tough to find a recession-proof business. What industry is the most profitable industry to be in? So if I was gonna give 10, 15, 20 hours a week of my life to something, why not invest it into the industry that has the highest potential for a rate of return of income on my yeah. time? The common denominator that kept coming up is how the economy is affecting their business. Money. Interest rates are this, so it costs as much, so now we gotta mark up this, or our profits are this. As our industry and the insurance industry, a bad economy actually helps. Yes. 21% more people during COVID bought life insurance. So for me, it's all about how can I get people's eyeballs on a message and where you have the highest likelihood of that happening. Social media is massive because you got, what, 200 million people that are on social media. I don't have to come knock on your door. I just have to slide into your pocket because you're in front of this thing eight hours a day. Pastors always say, if you want your friends to respect you, they may have to do business with you. Make your first 100000 If you want your peers to respect you, make your 500000 If you want the industry to respect you, make a million bucks. Yeah. You can get to 100,000 by yourself, but you have to build a team. So many companies, industries, they don't have a process by which they could take what they do and pass it off to somebody else. You have to insulate yourself from a bad economy. The profit margins. Our business is insane because we have no inventory. They're doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Their lifestyle is not the same yeah. as what I get to enjoy being in this industry. Right. And it, it gave me so much gratitude for, for, for having a strong business that's not affected by the economy. If you haven't done insurance, try insurance. Like there's a reason why it's the most profitable industry in the US. There's a reason why the financial services industry has made more millionaires than any other industry. So if you're gonna get your feet into the pool, why not start in the place where you have the highest probability of success? So what happens when you put together a college pastor, an Olive Garden server, and United States Marine together? Or four more for 2023. What happens when you put a white dude, a Cuban, Puerto Rican, and a Filipino dude together? You get another episode here of the Seven Figure Squad Millionaire Series. And guess what? To my left and to my right, we got both millionaires, my business partners here at PHP Agency. So George, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad. My pleasure, brother. It's an honor to be on. And we got to welcome Gaines because he's a brand new millionaire. I'm a Ooh. freshman. He's a freshman fire. of the squad. <laughs> He's so new. <laughs> I smell the <I> money. <laughs> so uh, unique thing too as well, we've all moved from Illinois and California respectively. Yes. To Texas. So how's Austin, by the way? Uh, Austin's beautiful, man. People are friendly, great for business, good nature, lakes, fun. It's great all the way around, man. Great food, great music. It's a great city. Different than California, different than LA? It, you're free. Re wow. People are real and you're free. Yeah. What, yep. what about you coming from Lodi, California? Uh, well, Lodi was, only God knows where Lodi is. There's <laughs> there's more sheep than people in Lodi. And, and grapes. And grapes, grapes and, yeah. You know, a lot of farm, farm, farm out there. And I'm from Chicago, so uh, I, I experienced freedom here too as well. And uh, apparently uh, they only masked up only here for about two months and everybody went back to the you know, I'm just living my life here in Dallas. So. <laughs> Uh, we're loving Dallas, and for those of you following uh, the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel, uh, we love interviewing folks who are not just talking to talk, but more importantly, they're walking the walk. So, my question for these gentlemen here from their respective cities of Austin and right here in Dallas, Texas, we're going to uh, unpack some of the things that they've experienced on their journey towards becoming a cash flow first generation cash flow millionaire. So, um, 18 years old, you started your business, George. Uh, what was your first limiting belief? I know sometimes we have these uh, delusions of grandeur. At 18 years old, like I'm gonna be somebody. Did you ever think that uh, you'd be in this situation and, and becoming a millionaire? Uh, I hoped, there's this great quote that says, I hope to win, but I expect to fail. Coming from nobody in my family succeeding at that level, uh, you don't necessarily believe that you can, and uh, you don't think maybe you're good enough, smart enough, funny enough, charming enough, uh, good at networking, you don't have the right network, you don't have the right pedigree. And so I think the first challenge I had to overcome at 18, 19 was, a limiting belief that I could even do it. Uh, I thought some people were born with it and some people were meant to be successful. And I had that stemmed from never truly committing to a process and realizing that you can get better every single day now in, in that. And that's, it sounds so naive, it sounds so uh, uh, ignorant to think that way, but if you've never committed to something in your life, you don't truly understand that progress is possible. You know, and only when you say, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna quit on this when it gets hard and you actually commit to it and you start getting better, do you realize that that confidence and that certainty comes from progress, not your ego? And so that was my first uh, limiting belief I had to overcome that it was even possible for a guy like me. 
it's funny because we did a RV tour, I think about five years ago. We had our, we had our faces on the side of an RV. Yeah. Our, our, our CEO is kind of crazy like that. So we did a, we did a, uh, a world, uh, not worldwide, uh, nationwide tour. And um, we're, in, we're in LA and uh, there's a flat tire. And so we went to, we <laughs> to try to get anybody to fix the flat tire. We went to uh, adjust tires. And so the guy comes up to the RV and he looks up at his side. He's like, oh, I know that guy. And who? That guy, George Palayo. I was in business with him like five years ago that's and I quit funny. and I'm still working at Jess Tires. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's Ouch. crazy. We land, we got here today and I went to get a gift card at Capitol Grill for, uh, for, for, for Tom Dempsey. And the guy's like, are you George Palayo? No kidding. <laughs> and, Look at yeah, that. And, and he's like, dude, I used to work at Red Lobster too. Now I'm here, but I want to get out of, I want to get out of this, you know, my next phase in life. And we're at the airport, man, and these people are like, hey, are you George Black? And it's just so funny because PHP, the whole community, yeah, yeah, you know, all yeah. over the United States, no matter where you are, there's mm-hmm. somebody in the agency that's there. But yeah, it's funny, man, funny story. You just never know who has been through our doors and uh, sadly didn't stick with the talking about commitment. Yep. He's here today because he committed to the process, committed to the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. What about yourself? Coming from, coming from a ministry background, yeah. college pastor. Uh, was there any limiting beliefs there that you had uh, being in a college, being recruited into the insurance industry about starting this journey? Oh, a ton. Um, I think for first off, like you think about, um, we talk about servant leadership a lot. And um, I think servant leadership for, for me was also an escape of having to take pressure on in leadership. Because as long as all I have to do is serve somebody or be in a service role, then there's no necessary expectations for excellence or things like that. So then you get into a business setting and you're still serving people. You're still thinking about them more than yourself. And But now there's expectation. Now there's mm-hmm. excellence. Now there's accountability. And a lot of times working in the nonprofit world or in the church world, there's not a lot of accountability. And there's not a lot of accountability for excellence because you're dealing with volunteer armies and things yeah. like that. And so having to step into a place where performance mattered, where excellence mattered, accountability mattered, the big limiting belief for me was, well, I don't know if I can be number one. I don't know if I can be successful, but maybe I can just help somebody else be number one. And so I naturally fit into what we call a flag carrier. And it was an easy, comfortable role. And I thrived in it, but it also didn't require a lot of pressure. So for me, kind of getting into the business space, overcoming the limiting belief was saying, I can take the pressure. I can handle the pressure. I want the pressure. Give me the accountability and be off to the races. And that, that took time. Gotcha. Because a lot of time people think it's an overnight thing and, you know, uh, what was it like? Let me ask you guys real, real quick, quick speed round to kind of uh, uh, mix things up. What was harder for you, making your first hundred thousand dollars or making your first million? My, 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 my first, my first hundred thousand. Because, uh, um, because I didn't. I, I, I when I'm a great employee. So it, when I had a job, I'd go. I'd be early. Uh, I'd have my outfit. Uh, you know, serving people in food. Never wore a shirt. Didn't wash it. Press everything. Even our you know, where we put our books and our pens. Uh, I, I'm a great employee. I show up on time, I give great service, on time, money, everything. But then I become an entrepreneur and I realize I'm not a great entrepreneur because I'm not great at being my own boss. You know, when you hear that comment, be your own boss, it sounds great because you think, man, I'm the boss until you have to be the boss. You know, and then yeah. you're like, oh shoot, yeah. I gotta give a schedule. Oh shoot, I gotta have accountability. Oh shoot, I gotta process. Oh shoot, I gotta review. Oh shoot, I gotta plan for the next day. So I'll, again, it goes back to that overestimating your ability and underestimating the effort. And uh, so I quit my job. I'm not even licensed. We can't make money in our in our business without <laughs> that. License, yeah. And then I realized, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. And uh, I'm at the point of potentially not even moving forward and I get a call from Pat and it was a life-saving phone call. And he says, are you quitting because you found something better that can help you get to your dream? No. He says, well, then you're not, you're not quitting. You're not quitting because you found something better than you're just quitting because it's difficult. You're quitting because it's hard and that makes you a quitter. <clears throat> and he says, and I bet that this isn't the first thing that you've quit at in your life. Wow. And, uh, and he was absolutely right, man. And I said, man, this, I got to, I got to stick with this. Yeah. I got to stick with this. That was the hardest part to make my first hundred grand because people jump around from place to place, business to business, sales to sales, yeah. and they don't stick it out. Ah. Um, so it was it was tough, man. But once we made that, it was one of the greatest accomplishments that you didn't quit. You know. So different question, similar question though. Yeah. What was harder for you, making two fifty from a hundred thousand, making five hundred thousand from two fifty, making a million from five hundred? What was harder for you? Uh, I think the biggest. Uh, I would say the I don't know which was hardest, but I'd say the biggest what required the most change was going from 250 to a mil. Because the disciplines and the habits that it took me to go from 100 to 250, 
uh, I had to be a little bit more disciplined, pay attention to some more details, but I could roughly run the same systems. I could be a little bit more intentional with some things, but it didn't require an overhaul. But identity-wise, going from 250 to a mil, there were a different level of intentionality with leaderships, conversations I wasn't having that I had to have, systems I wasn't running that I had to run, staff that I didn't have that I had to get, yeah. a way of being with staff and yeah. developing them that you don't have to. So. Uh, for me, that jump was harder than 150 to 250, yeah. but the first 100 is for sure the, yeah. that's where you learn everything about yeah. yourself. That's interesting because, you know, you know Patrick's always said, you know, if you, if you want your friends to respect you, they may not do business with you, make your first 100,000. Yeah. If you want your peers uh, to respect you, make your 500,000. If you want your team to respect you, make 250. If you want the, 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 the industry to respect you, make a million bucks. Because yeah. we're in the insurance business and there's a lot of guys, what do you think it's, it's easier to do or harder to do? Um, build your way to a million bucks or just sell to 100,000? What, what do you think is, is a pal palatable for a lot of, a lot of I, folks? I think it's a, a lot harder to build your way to a million dollars because you can get to 100,000 by yourself, but you have to build a team to get to... You might even get uh, to 250,000 by yourself, right? You could. You, you probably get to a few hundred grand, but at one point you're going to max out. So then you start saying, well, let me get into a better market and bigger clients and you start solving for that. Or I gotta increase my volume. But at one point, there's only so much volume you can do because there's there is a capacity to, you know, you have 24 hours in a day. So I definitely think developing other people's habits, it's hard enough to change yourself, but then you move into a position of leadership and now you need to uh, coach a guy from a $15 an hour mentality to a $50 an hour mentality to a $200 mentality. Like you're having to change to help this person become a leader. And uh, that's definitely much more challenging. It requires a lot more patience. Uh, it requires a lot more processing. And, um, but it's also the most uh, rewarding in terms of when, when you help somebody become who they're supposed to be in this world, uh, I think it's extremely rewarding as well. So. Yeah, I, I run into that in the insurance industry. A lot, a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to worry about other people. I just want to worry about myself. Now, granted, they make 100000 a year, 200000 a year, maybe even 500000 a year. But unless they have to put them in a position where you have to sell something, they're not gonna make any money. There's not, there's no that passive, there's no that uh, override income towards it. So a uh, qu question for you, social media has been a big boost to your business. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're very well followed and uh, how, how would you rate or how would you grade the importance of social media, getting your message out using social media to grow your brand where more people are attracted to to, to do business with you? I mean, for sure, it's it's like any market. If whatever you focus on, if you develop it, you get good at it, it'll it'll work, it'll bring you stuff. Some people, I was at a networking event last night and someone was telling me, man, my wife, she like thrives in this space. I don't thrive in this space. Uh, but he has a space he thrives in. So if if someone can play to their strengths, they're, they're gonna be in a good spot. Social media is massive because you got, what, 200 million people that are on social media. Right. So I tell folks, I don't have to come knock on your door, I just have to slide into your pocket <laughs> and because you're in front of this thing eight hours a day. Yeah. So for me to get in front of you, I don't need you to pick up the phone. I just need you to open up your app. And so for me, it's all about how can I get people's eyeballs on a message and where do you have the highest likelihood of that happening? So I think it's a big deal. For the people that if you coach, George, uh, what is the top one, two, three traits you see of winners? And what's the top one, two, three traits you see of quitters? Well, when I see winners, I would say that they have a, it's, it's funny because the people that I do the least for, in terms of holding their hand, do the best. Interesting. They, they, they need the, less, the least amount, like the, the smallest investment in them produces the greatest return. You know, you put a dollar and you get a hundred, or you put a hundred dollars and you get, you just put, uh, you get a hundred, you know, you get a, 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 a hundred percent fold versus a thousand, a thousand percent. So I would say that they're, they're independently, intrinsically driven. There's a great book by Daniel Pink called Drive, and he says the number one thing that people want in this world is autonomy and they want to look at what drives people and they say okay well what if we pay more money what if we pay more this what if we what if we do this um, and he said people really just successful people just want more control in their life and 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 I think that that's the quality of most entrepreneurs they want to be more in control of their decisions and so that in turn that intrinsic drive versus external motivation mm -hmm. I think they have intrinsic motivation I would also say number two is they have they've seen pain. There's something that they want to change about their life. Yeah. Uh, whether it's the way they saw their mom or their dad grow up, whether it was somebody that was disrespected, whether the fact that they felt a certain level of insecurity because they couldn't have what that other person had. So they felt like they were less than and they don't want to, they don't want to feel that way about themselves. Um, 
So there's there's intrinsic drive. Uh, there there's some kind of pain, right? And and the last one I would say they're they're so humble, hungry to learn. Like their spirit, they're the most grateful, humble people. The most successful people are the most are the, are the most humble. So I would say those are the three qualities that have I've seen in people that I like to also work with. Pat said something on call the other day. He said. If you're the, uh, you look at who do you like to work with the most, it's the people that are the most grateful for you, yeah. Yeah. you know? So they have that gratitude, that humility. Uh, and on the flip side of it, if there was, uh, you know, two things that I would say that get in the way of that, it would be uh, ego, right? They're, 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 they're selfish. You have a great quote you said to me at one breakfast. You said, life gives to the givers, takes from the takers, and has a very great accounting system. That's right. I've said that to all my guys. We had them read a book called Give, uh, Give and Take after that. And uh, I have just some people on my team that no matter what, they're, they're, they're takers, you yeah. know? And they can even be successful takers, yeah. but they're only gonna get to a certain level yeah. because people are gonna realize this person really doesn't care about me, all they care about is themselves. Yeah. So I, th I think that, that selfishness um, and that ego um, kill people. And the last one I would say is entitlement, you know, that they feel entitled. Yeah. Uh, to this, to certain things versus uh, versus true true humility, man. It's it's a rare quality to find yeah. in a very intelligent, successful, driven person, and it's such a beautiful thing when you get that hungry, humble, and and great people skills from like the ideal yeah. team player that we read. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at coming from a faith and ministry standpoint, there's a guy at the office on Tuesday, and he wants to succeed in business, but he goes, man, but I also want to be in ministry, which is great. That's an honor, sure. honorable aspect. And I told him, I said, you know what? I, I, I look at my business as ministry because I've created a lot of come to Jesus moments. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, because we're dealing with people's finances. Yeah. And sometimes the problem with their finances isn't the X's and O's, it's not the plus and minus, it's not the assets and liabilities. Yeah. It's you. There's a spiritual stronghold that's going on, mental strong, get your mind right, get your spirit right. So for the people that say, man, I, I you know, you know, God just doesn't want to feed into my ambition. I got to serve the Lord. I got to, I got to, find a ministry and, and sometimes people feel guilty finding success in their business and success in their finances. What would, yeah. you, say, what would you say to a person that's, that's limiting themselves in that, in that thought process? Well, I'd say one, that's not true. Um, that's a blueprint. You were given that blueprint by somebody, like somebody gave you that mindset. You didn't come out of the womb being like, I'm gonna serve God and I have to do it by being a priest, a nun, a pastor, a rabbi. Like you didn't, you didn't, you weren't born with that, but someone told you that. So if we rewind and we look at, okay, well, what did God do when he wrote your book? Like when he wrote your life, if God was an engineer and he had this like paper out and he's like, I'm gonna create Matt Zipala. Yeah. I'm gonna create him this way, design him this way. You always design something for a purpose. So where's the, where's the niche? Where's the puzzle piece where this piece of engineering of humanity fits into the greater puzzle that's going on? Yeah. So if you go back to the original blueprint of how God made you, not the blueprint that you were given by an institution, I think you can, you can, you can find some stuff that you'll miss otherwise. So for me, I remember when I clearly heard Holy Spirit say, I trained you in the church, but I called you to the marketplace. Because there's people who are never mm -hmm. gonna walk into the four doors mm -hmm. that boom. And for me, that was hard because my whole blueprint was, I've got to serve in this one way. One thing I'll say briefly is if someone does read the Bible, there's this passage in the book called Ephesians. Yeah. And it says that God created uh, apostles, pastors, prophets, evangelists, and teachers yeah. so that they could go develop, duplicate, equip the entire body for service. And unfortunately, most of the folks that I talk to, they are, their belief system is that those five roles, those five positions, those five, whatever you wanna call them, they only exist inside the structure of the church. Right. And that's just not true. Yeah. There are pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists who are in every sector of society. So maybe God wants to empower you to walk in the authority of that type of position in a completely different domain. And so, yeah, when, when I was a, a, a college pastor, we were pretty competitive, and we <laughs> would, we would uh, on the back of the door of the church, anytime one of the college students would say, you know what, I wanna either give my life to God or I wanna come back to God or whatever, I wanna get baptized, I got baptized, I get baptized. We would just like keep a tally mark in the back of the door and no one knew what it was, but we just kept like tallying. And over like seven years, there were about 72, 73 people that like made a legitimate decision. Amen. I wanna give my life to God and I wanna keep following through with it, right? I don't go with the sign and dice where you like see once and you're like, <laughs> I'm not know what happened, right? Back to what the next day. Yeah, I don't know. But um, it was crazy because when my wife and I got into business and we started running an office and we're really invested into the lives of the people that we were working yeah. with and serving, uh, I, we stopped counting at over 400 people who had made a decision to 
follow the teachings of Christ, go to church, get baptized and really get off the races. So um, for me, just looking at impact, I'm like, I follow, where's the fruit? I don't care about your blueprint. I don't care about the theological will prove that not look at the fruit and where there's fruit, that's where you're going to go. That's awesome, man. Yeah. For the very first time I I, uh, had a retreat because we moved down here to Texas a couple years ago. We just bought a house last November and we finally had our train. We had a trainer trainer event here at at our, in here in Dallas. And um, I said, let me take a stab at this. Invited my friend over, Steve Weatherford. He won a, he won a Super Bowl with the New York Giants, but he's a, he's a, he's a, unapologetic man of God, right? He's, he's about, I'm about Jesus. Yeah. And because uh, he was a drug addict, he was addicted to the porn, cocaine, the whole thing, even though he's a Super Bowl champ. Anyway, God restored his life and he's, he's walking this amazing uh, walk right now. He's got his business around that. And at the same time, he came like he's a neighbor. So I had him come over. Next thing you know, man, he shares a word, everybody's moved. The next thing you know, we're baptizing people in my pool. <laughs> wow. I hadn't jumped into the pool yet that year, but I did to baptize people. So, uh, uh, George, when, when you're looking at some That's areas awesome, of bro. practicality, brother, um, what were some early skills that you learned to perfect to get you on a road to working for yourself 100%, leaving Olive, uh, Olive Garden and, and uh, Darden restaurants and leaving Red Lobster? What were some areas of practicality of skills that you learned how to master to get you to start equaling and exceeding your full-time income on a part-time basis starting a business that compounded to 100000 to a $1 million a year? So if you look at any business, they all have hours of operation, right? Every restaurant yeah. we go to, every barber shop. Um, churches, you know, nine o'clock, 11 o'clock, they have hours of operation. So we did a meeting the other day with some of my up and coming entrepreneurs. And I said, Hey guys, what's your hours of operation? And this, Ooh. these are guys in our base, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and they're like, uh, you know, I don't have any, you know, I just work when I, when I can, <laughs> you know, I show up when I can. And if you only do things when you can, you're not, you're never going to be successful, yeah. you know? Um, so, so I had to cre- start creating a schedule for myself on a part-time basis. If I wasn't at uh, school, if I wasn't at the restaurant, that uh, I was going to be in the office. And that really required a discipline to have a second shift in the day. You know, you'd finish nine to five uh, at school and work and this, and then five thirty, six o'clock till 10 or 11. And at one point you're really, you are burning the candle on both ends so that you can get out of that situation faster. And when you don't do the things that you need to do, you don't avoid the pressure, you delay the pressure. So now you're putting that pain and that work into the future and making it harder uh, on the future version of you. So I think think one was starting to create a a, a schedule. And then two um, was creating a reward punishment system it's easy to just go through the day and be like, oh, I'll get it tomorrow. Oh, I'll work on it next week. Oh, it's, it's okay. We'll get it done this month. You keep extending the, 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 the deadline, right? And as long as you keep extending the deadline, you never, you never hit the goal. It's like a snooze button. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, yeah. A little bit more time. Yeah. A little bit more time. And so I started creating a, a reward punishment system for myself because my job had one, right? When, when you have a job, if you don't do the job, your punishment system is you're fired. Your reward system is you get a paycheck, yes, right. right? And in business, it's the same thing. You don't have a, a system, you don't perform, you're fired, and you're gonna go build somebody else's dream because you don't have the discipline to build your own. You're gonna need somebody to manage you. And I just didn't want to do that. I remembered what that felt like, not being in control of any aspect of my life. Yep. So uh, learning how to create a reward punishment system. And then number three, the last one I would say, is not using faith or family or health as a reason not to perform. You know, uh, I'm, I'm gonna miss a meeting, something's going on and Pat would ask me a question. Hey, so if you were running your own business and you're running a restaurant, would you would you be closed today because of that? No. Would you have still opened up? Yes. But what if you have somebody in the hospital? Would you just say, ah, restaurant closed, hotel closed, office closed? No, you'd still have to do that. And that's the hard part is when we first hear that from somebody, maybe a consultant or friend or mentor or a book we're reading, we think that person is so freaking care. They don't care. Yeah. They're just they're just cold hearted. They don't understand my situation until you realize that that person had to overcome those same things in order to be successful. And they're trying to help you break through. And typically where you're making the most excuses, you have the most opportunity. And um, and I had to change the way I looked at this person as no man, they don't care versus they're such a great example of what's possible if I don't use those things as an excuse in my life. Birthdays, yeah. holidays. And Pat would always say, Look at look at the look at are they playing the Super Bowl today? Hey, it's Christmas. Yeah. Guess where everybody's guess where everybody's watching? Yeah. They're watching the game. Yeah. Those professional athletes, those actors, those soldiers that we admire, people like yourself that served in the military, they don't they don't live the same life that everybody else does. 
they have a higher standard in their life. And it's hard to do that. But if you're willing to do that, that the, uh, the, the quote is, if you're willing to live a, year, a few years of your life, like most people won't, you can live the rest of your life like most people can't. I love you it, know, that, that, is, that is the truth. And we're, we're getting the, like you said, fruits, we're getting the fruits of those sacrifices yeah. that we made early on without seeing those, the reward early on. Yep, yep, a lot of delayed gratification. It seems like you say that because I'm thinking about these athletes, but also the concession people are working, the security people are working, the cops are working, a lot of people are they're working too as well. So you know, you're right, absolutely. Um, we just came back from the vault. Right? Yeah. So we all just came back from the vault, St. Patrick run his thing. What shocked you the most about, about our business, because we're in the insurance business, what shocked you the most as you kind of parallel our industry, our business, our ways of making revenue compared to the, the uh, 3,000 people that were there, the, the, the 50 different industries that were there, what, what did you see that was pretty significant? It's like, well, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you three things really clear. One, the profit margins. Our business is insane because we have no inventory. We have yep. almost no ever overhead functionally compared to a lot of other right. types of businesses. Um, talking to somebody who, you know, they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, yep. uh, but their income, their lifestyle is not the same yeah. as what I get to enjoy being in this industry. Right. But my revenue is like <laughs> a yeah. fraction of what theirs is. And so just, I think the profit margins is a, is a big piece of it. Um, so see, that's something, because I have a hundred million dollar company, like, wow, you're making a hundred million dollars a year. No, you're not. That's not the situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so uh, just looking at it as a business of, man, if I tell people all the time, because a lot of people do our business part-time, instead of doing Uber, Lyft, real estate, whatever they're doing. Uh, if you were gonna go put 10 to 15, 20 hours a week into something, why not invest your time the way you invest your money? Because when you invest money, you put it into whatever asset you feel is gonna give you the highest rate of return. Mm -hmm. May or may not, but that's what your belief is. So why don't we invest our time that way? We spend our time, we just don't invest it. Yeah. So we spend our time at a job or spend our time at something that's easy. Oh, I can download this app and do this and it's easy. I can go try this and it's easy. I can do e-commerce, it's easy. I can do crypto and it's easy. As opposed to thinking about spending where it's easy, we think about investing. Man, what industry is the most profitable industry to be in? So if I was gonna give 10, 15, 20 hours a week of my life to something, why not give it invested into the industry that has the highest potential for a rate of return of income on my yeah. time? So one piece is that. Um, second is just systems. Yeah. So many companies, industries, they don't have a process by which they could take what they do and pass it off to somebody else. Yeah. So you know the whole conversation Tom Ellsworth was having about not just how do you build your company to sell it one day, how do you build your company so you can have a life yeah, one day? Yeah. <laughs> and built into what you were talking about with leadership development and pouring into people is if you can duplicate, if you can replicate, um, you, you create a much more sustainable way to have a business and really have a life that you enjoy that allows you to do so many things. Yeah. And so having that process. Um, and the third one was how, how crazy it is that folks, when they, when they look at our model, when they look at our company, when they look at insurance, there's such a preconceived notion about what it means to be in insurance. But when you look at other industries, there's not really a preconceived notion. Everyone just thinks, well, I'm gonna work as hard until I'm rich, then I'm gonna die. But when you really get into those businesses and you see what kind of industry could give someone a fulfilling life, the ability to give back, serve, do the kinds of things they wanna do, um, what Pat's done with the vault to give people a duplicatable process is insane. But when people look on the outside of insurance yeah. versus from a lot of these business owners saying, so what's insurance like? What's it like being with Pat? Versus the actual inside, it's, it's so different. It's interesting how people are paying tens of thousands of dollars and time in three days to be there just to learn the values and principles and systems he's built PHP with that we were rocking with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep. That to us are literally second nature. Right. In the yeah. Marines, you yeah. were saying just a few minutes ago, everybody knows how to shoot a gun. Everybody knows how to do field mm -hmm. navigation. Like it's just basic right. operating procedure. Right. Yeah. That's it. Uh, you've had different stabs at Business 2, George. You know, you uh, you know you were putting out there on your live videos. You're investing in real estate. You're you're building an insurance business. What's what what's your perspective and experiences with building a real estate investing type of business, and also building an insurance business? Uh, I think it ties into the question that you asked on what what did you notice the difference between the vault and all these different business owners. The the the, the common denominator that kept coming up is how the economy is affecting their business. Wow. Right. Hey, uh, well, it costs us this much money. Interest rates are this, so it costs us much. So now we got to mark up this, or our profits are this. Um, when we were we we, I, we we did this teardown in Marina del Rey, and we're building this 
uh, like mini mansion uh, out there by the by the by the beach in in, in Los Angeles, California area, and um, the plans are wrong, and it's one little thing that's off, and now we got to go to the city, and there's two three months of processing time where we can't build anything, the can't move stuff is done. Yeah. yeah, there was an ordinance that was changed, and so wow. they want us to tear this down, rebuild it. Steel beams are in it's it's very yeah. it was complicated. We're carrying all these carrying costs the entire time. Because you're servicing debt. Correct. And contractors, there's, there, yeah. there, there's Unless you're self-funding, there's yeah. a cost to borrow money. Yeah. And you're paying all these carrying costs. By the time we get this done, then weather is now factored in. So the, t- the timing of the, you know, if you're a real estate developer and you're trying to finish certain stuff during the winter season, depending where you live, it's very, it's very tough. So you're factoring that weather. Um, and, then, and then COVID came in. Right, so now there's slowdowns in in terms of processing times, right? Wow. For for other for other other permits or or, or or things, and then now we go to the market. It's finally done, and now we're bringing a mini mansion into sell at the market at the time where people don't know if the world's going to shut down. <laughs> the, the racks are empty when you're going to the supermarket at that yeah. time. Yeah. So now you have to sell this asset at so much when you were projecting this. Yeah. You know, it was we. Lo- I, I lost over a million dollars wow. investing in real estate. It's not something I'm proud of. I learned the lessons, and I would say a couple things to the entrepreneurs, whatever yeah. business you're in. Diversifying yourself into multiple businesses at the same time is very difficult unless you have staff, systems, operations to where you can do that. And I think there's a lot of failure in that. A lot of entrepreneurs, multiple streams of income. They're trying to do all these different things, and there's no system or support to to do those other things. So. That was a challenge. The economy was definitely a challenge. Yeah. And it, it gave me so much gratitude for, for for having a strong business that's not affected by the economy. And I think that as a, as a, as a husband, uh, as a parent, person that provides for my son, my parents, you have to insulate yourself from a bad economy. And it's very difficult to do that. And so you gotta figure out how do I do that? How do I, how do I insulate myself against what's gonna go on in the economy? Because it's gonna keep going up and down. We got guys that we've recruited that uh, through John Mason that's doing mortgages, stud, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands last year, hasn't done a deal this year, you wow. know, because of interest rates. So nine, nine months into it, wow. nine, hundreds of thousands to zero this year, zero. So, you know, economy affects most businesses and it's tough to find a, a recession-proof business. And, and when you're in that run in, in those industries, you don't think nothing's gonna go bad. No. You know, it's, it's like, I'm making 20,000, I'm 50,000, 100,000, I'm a millionaire. And yet, I'm in an industry that is directly affected by the interest rates in the economy. Yep. Whereas our industry, in the insurance industry, a bad economy actually helps. Yes. Twenty-one percent more people during COVID bought life insurance. <laughs> we, had, we had a spike in we had a spike in sales of teenagers buying insurance policies, and then when the interest rates goes up, who benefits? Our clients. Yeah. Our clients benefit from a rising interest rate. So, um, as I wrap up, I'll, I'll finish with you. As we wrap up. Somebody's on this journey. They, they, they want to be financially free. They want to find a pandemic-proof business, a recession-proof business. They want to be able to find themselves uh, in, in an industry that's willing to give back. Uh, what, what words of encouragement, uh, what things to avoid? What would you say to somebody who is watching this right now who's aspiring to become a first-generation cash flow? Well, I mean, you're gonna say I'm biased, but like, if you haven't done insurance, try insurance. Like, There's a reason why it's the most profitable industry in the US. There's a reason why the financial services industry has made more millionaires than any other industry. So if you're gonna get your feet into the pool, why not start in the place where you have the highest probability of success? I realize there's so many things out there that are, they're sexy, they're flashy, the marketing, the this, and it looks good, or I had a friend who this, I had a mentor who this, I had an uncle who this, and that's great, but they may have been doing something that they can't duplicate or replicate, or the economy may have been different. Um, but if you look at the, the history of the people who've had success in this industry, I'd say if you're looking to get into entrepreneurship, man, why don't you start where there's the, the highest probability? And then if you find something from there that you're like, hey, I'm going to do this niche, more power to you. But yeah, I'm, I'm biased. Yep. And on top of that, you can work with a guy like you. Hey, well, you know. On a, on a, on a day, day-to-day basis. May or may be a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 George, a different question for you because you're now a new dad. Uh, 11 months uh, 11 months 11 months old now 14 weeks <laughs> all right it's awesome and of course and uh, Danielle's uh, pregnant again yeah boom boom yeah. so it's like right there two boys <laughs> don't freak it off like guy times man he's raising a king's family so I'm a dad out there I just got married I had kids I'm working a full time job to provide right now I'm barely making ends meet why should I consider entrepreneurship and things are so tight and tough and people are, are a lot of fear is being put on the marketplace today why consider going into entrepreneurship let alone insurance I remember this this man asked a question to us. We were at a 
little mastermind at, at his home. And he said, if you had 30 seconds left to live, what would be the three things you tell your kids are the most important things? And I probably said this 10,000 times. I said, I don't know, I don't have kids and I'm, you know, I'm a younger guy. I said, what are yours? And he says, one, I'd be a person of faith, two, marry the right person, and three, stay in control. And I think that the point to, I'm a young, I'm a dad, and I got a couple kids and I got a job, why entrepreneurship? Why go through all this? Why am I gonna put myself through this? Why am I gonna struggle? Why? You know, and we only sometimes see that we're such short-term thinkers in this world. Pat talked about uh, at the at the vault, right? You're an amateur. You're in the next one to two, three, four moves. You're a master. You're in five to nine. You're a, uh, uh, I'm sorry. You're a professional. You're five to nine. You're a master. You're ten to fourteen. You're a grandmaster. You're fifteen moves ahead. Life is a. Uh, it goes by quick, but it's a, it's a short-term thing. It goes by so fast, but it's a long-term game, and you got to start thinking long-term. Hey, man. Yeah. I want to be able to, to cut the check to my daughter when she says I'm getting married and have to, she could pick the wedding of her dreams, you know, that she could pick the place that she wants to get married. And I have to worry about how much that day is going to cost her on a credit card. Man, when my kids go to college, the fact that I can, you know, they could pick a school and they don't have to worry about if the bank's going to approve them. You know, that when my parents get sick later in life, I can pay like what you guys do for your dad. You know, mm. that you could take care of those yeah. bills yeah. and give them. Uh, I think the greatest thing that you can give to an older parent outside of legacy, knowing that their legacy is living on, is dignity in the last chapter of their life. Yeah. So that you can, you, can, you can cut that check for them to have somebody take care of them the right way, love them the right yeah. way, versus being in some kind of hospital where they're getting abused, yeah. you know? And neglected, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, do something where you, at the end of your life, where you can say, man, I'm so proud of, I'm so proud of my effort. Was I a perfect man? No. Uh, was I, did I, did I do everything I could? Probably not. But man, did I fight? Did I give my best? Yeah, that you can have that peace in your spirit as it, as you transition, that your eulogy, your legacy, what your kids are going to say about you. Um, that, that, you know, that John, uh, John Gordon says, it's not what you give to people, but what you leave in people when you're not here. You know, so your kids are going to see you fight for your dream so that they can believe that it's possible for them too. And if you don't, and you use your kids as a reason why you're not, why you can't, mm -hmm. you're using your why as your why not, you know? And, and you're using your kids as your excuses, as your crutch versus as your catapult. And so I think it's, I think you have to, I don't know my great, great grandpa, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you guys do. Yeah. Um, how is it possible that all these generations have ever come before us, but, but we grew up struggling? Somebody's got to be that, that person. So the last thing I'd say is, you know, there's that quote that says, if you don't come from a rich family, a rich family should come from you. Uh, and not just in money, but in terms of the way that people think. And uh, go fight the war, man. Go, go fight for your family. Um, it's worth it. It's going to suck. 18, 24 months. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. You're going to want to quit. Yeah. But uh, when you're free and you make every decision, outside of the ones that God makes in terms of health and, and all that, it's so worth it. And uh, I can never imagine my life. I cannot imagine being a GM today at a restaurant making 180,000 a year when we have a month where we'll make 150,000 in a month, a month. Yeah. you know? I can't imagine somebody else deciding if my, uh, telling my wife what to do, you know? Yeah. I can't decide how to man giving her a yeah, yeah saying hey I own your wife yeah. I, I tell her where to be <laughs> I can't imagine like that angers me so you got to know what motivates you I'm moved by anger yeah. um, I just I just I just can't uh, uh, I can't imagine that so the consequence of not being free the only thing worse sometimes than paying the price because it sucks to pay the price to win at the level that, that sometimes you have to it's just not winning you know so um, yeah. At least this one, at least this this pain comes with a blessing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Or Tim Grover, you know, he, he came to our event one time. He says, uh, if you don't want to pay the price for success, wait till you get the bill for regret. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no bank for that, bro. No. And nope. so the coolest thing about this, George Gaines, is that in 2023, we're rocking this video and we're going to upload it. And um, something happens to us 50 years from now, 80 years from now, and in our kids have kids and are great grandkids, guess what they're able, able to find? Yeah. This episode. Yeah. How old so are you now? 37. You know what great grandpa looked like at 37. <laughs> That's awesome.
That's why we do this, man. So when we're doing these videos, yeah, it's for our current audience today. But it's gonna be a future archive, future time capsule, a living time capsule, what gra grandpa, great grandpa George, and great grandpa Andrew was thinking about in 2023. And that's it, we're thinking about not just making millions, we're talking about generational wealth. And uh, you know, Proverbs says if, if, if you're not creating generational wealth, Right? You need to live, you need to leave as a father, your house and riches to the next generation. And so that's King Solomon, man. Make sure you watch the King Solomon series, the proper series here on the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. But that being said, it's so cool to have my friends here, my partners here, because I don't think this has ever been done. No. It's never been done, especially you, first time. I know. First time, so uh, <laughs> now that we moved from California, California, Illinois, respectively down here to Dallas, Texas, we're gonna have a lot more conversations this where more millionaires are being created by our company than ever in the history of financial service, more million are being created by this organization. So great to rock with these guys. We got a long run life ahead of us. That being said, if, whatever your thoughts are, please put in the comment section below. What was your biggest takeaway from George? What was your biggest takeaway from Andrew? Please put in the comment section below. And the whole time we've been putting their Instagram and YouTube links, make sure you follow them too as well. So with that being said, on behalf of George Palayo, Andrew Gaines, I'm your mighty smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be mighty smart today. God bless you guys, bye-bye.